Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I hope everyone is keeping healthy and safe in these crazy times. And, you know, we thank you very much for joining us tonight and for your interest in the very real and very important public health issue, which is myopia management. I'm Dr. Bruce Morgan, and I will be the moderator of our session this evening. Tonight's webinar is focused on the use of topography in orthokeratology practice and by the number of registrants joining us tonight, as well as the frequent requests we feel for this type of education, there is clearly a high demand for this level of training. Now, regardless of the type of topographer or ortho K lens design you use in your practice, I can assure you there is valuable learning that will take place here tonight for everyone. Before we begin, uh, let me mention a, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you know, the information in this presentation is from the viewpoint of licensed eye care professionals in clinical practice. It may or may not reflect the FDA definition of orthokeratology or the approved use of the products mentioned. And let's get started by introducing the star and our presenter this evening, Mr. Randy Kojima. For anyone who has not attended previous training with Randy, let me assure you, you're in for a real treat. When it comes to understanding and effectively using topography and specialty lens practice, there is simply no one more knowledgeable in the eye care field today than Randy Kojima. Randy is the Clinical Research and Development Director for Precision Technology Services and Cardinal Contact Lens in Canada. And he also serves as research scientist and clinical instructor at the Pacific University College of Optometry. Additionally, he is the clinical advisor to the CAT Design Group and Medmont Instruments. Randy has published numerous articles on various contact lens related topics and has been a contributing author in a number of textbook chapters. He lectures globally and enjoys sharing insights, methods and research with eye care colleagues from around the world. Randy is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, the British Contact Lens Association, the Sclera Lens Education Society, and the International Academy of Orthokeratology. Please welcome Randy Kojima. Hey, Dr. Morgan, thanks so much. And, and thank you to all of you for logging in with us tonight. We, we hope this will be a valuable session. As Dr. Morgan introduced, the goal is to give you a introduction into corneal topography related to pre and post ortho K assessment. So very much a design for the neophyte, but we also hope there'll be some intermediate considerations for those of you that uh, actually practice ortho K. And then the other goal was to provide some instruction on how you use the topographer in alignment with the moon lens system. But it was important to Art Optical that our session tonight very much can be used regardless of the type of instrument you use or regardless of the system. So we hope you'll find this a very educational session. So let's get started. Well, topography is very important related to the moon lens because you're going to use the raw data from the instrument to design a highly customized lens, a lens that is designed to be accurate to the micron for all of its sections. So we really want good topography data to get that kind of optimal first lens and try to achieve the highest first fit success that we possibly can. Well, let's start with a case. Here's your baseline topography. This patient came in to see you and they want to have orthokeratology done. And you're going to assess this topography and decide are they a good or bad candidate? So what do you look at? And one of those things is obviously K readings. We're all so comfortable looking at K readings. Is it a steep or flat corny? Is it high or low um, astigmatism? And certainly in ortho K, when we look at the radii of the cornea, the steeper the cornea, the better the potential for ortho K, the flatter the cornea, the lower the potential. So um, steeper corneas, maybe higher refractive changes are possible. If you look at the corneal astigmatism, it's relatively low. In this case, 0.17 diopters, not even a quarter diopter of corneal astigmatism. 
that makes it a good candidate for ortho K. Obviously, the more spherical the cornea, the easier the fit and outcome might be. We could look at the eccentricity, and we see this cornea has a very median 0.65 E value. Now, so what? Well, the higher the E value, the better the potential for orthokeratology. Another thing that we might consider is the sagittal differential at eight millimeters is 12 microns, meaning that the cornea around the clock has very little difference in height. So all of these things, along with the pupil size and the visible iris diameter, they all help us to determine the candidacy. So we just wanted to give you an idea of what we wanted to talk about today, some of the many things that we might consider that helps you to determine good from bad candidate. Now, those were pre-fitting considerations. What about post-wear? What would you call this as an outcome? So that patient came to see you, you fit them with the moon lens, uh, they went home with the lens, they slept in it for the 8, 10, 12 hours, however long they slept, and they came back in the morning to see you and they had a healthy slit lamp exam, and here's the topography. So what do you do next? Do you continue with wear? Do you take this patient out of lenses because you're not happy with the topographical outcome? You know, what do you look at? How do you use the topography post-wear? And here we might say it appears like we have some central steepening rather than central flattening. But the story is you never use a post-treatment map by itself. You're going to use something called a subtractive map, which compares before ortho K to after ortho K and gives you the difference. So now that you're seeing a difference map, what would you say is the outcome of orthokeratology here? And you might look at the center and notice that there's some steepening in the apex. Is this what the topography experts call the central island? Is the blue treatment area riding high and we have this associated inferior smile. Is that the smiley face? So as you can tell, there's things that we need to understand about these topographies, both pre and post wear, so that we best understand um, how to move along in ortho K as efficiently as we can. So the goal tonight is to talk about many of these considerations that we've, we've just introduced in brief to you. Now, here's that same patient after 16 nights of wear in the same lens. And you notice that blue treatment zone appears to be a little high in relationship to the black pupil. So that little island that was there in the center has now disappeared after we allow more effect. And that makes sense because we know that ortho K full effect is seven to 10 days. So after one night, you might not expect to see all that you um, would like to. Let's go even longer. Now we're at two months and there's even more of that central treatment zone that's filling in. So here is a case where we have a pretty good visual outcome. This patient was very happy with their vision. The topography is suggesting that the effect is a little bit high. Look at the blue treatment zone in relationship to the black pupil. But because this patient was visually happy and the slit lamp was uh, negative of any signs, we felt that why don't we just continue and see how this patient does. Now you might also look at the baseline map and how the contours appear to be pulled north. Notice how this area of orange is a lot wider up here than it is down here that this orange color kind of comes around the, the bottom and whereas at the top it kind of disappears. So it, it looks like the contours, the steepest of the cornea is pulled superior and that might be contributing to why this lens is riding slightly high. So lots of things that we can learn from the topography and you will become very, very good at picking up on many of these nuances that helps you to determine do I just keep the patient in the same lens or do I discontinue and, and move on to different parameters? Now your first topography, how important really is it? Does it not matter that much because you're gonna put a lens on eye, you're gonna assess the floor seam pattern, um, you're going to determine if the patient's subjective comfort is okay. 
um, you know, how important is this baseline topography? And um, Dr. Morgan and I would suggest to you that this might be very important because it's that pre-fitting first topography is going to determine the first fit success. If you have the right moon lens parameters to start, then you're not going through refits. You're dispensing one set of lens and as they say, one and done. So the, the first topography is really important to the process. And when you consider that ortho K lenses are arguably one of the most complex constructions of contact lenses, then the baseline topography is really important. I mean, consider that we want to build a lens with about seven microns of fluid underneath the center, a tiny, tiny amount of fluid. So we want to get the height correct. We want the base curve to cornea relationship to be accurate so that we produce the um, effect of the myopic reduction that we're looking for. We need this reverse curve to be the appropriate height to give us this apical clearance that we want. We need the alignment zone that touches down on the corneal surface to create an ideal relationship lens to cornea. And then finally, we want the edge lift to be appropriate to create a healthy RGP fit. So there's many things that need to be right in a reverse geometry lens, and that's why it's so important that we have good baseline topography. Now, in this case, we had a good baseline map, and we did our post-treatment topography, and then clicked in our topographer to bring up the subtractive map. And here's your outcome. Now, what would you say is the outcome for this patient? Is it good? Um, does it need lens modification? Do we continue the patient with the lens? Do we discontinue the patient with the lens? And really what we want to see after one night of wear or the initial nights of wear is that this blue treatment zone appears relatively well centered to the black pupil. After one night, we don't have full effect. The Swarbrick and Elabri study done around 2003 showed us that Full effect is seven to 10 days. So we may not see all that we're going to after one night. So if you're happy that the treatment area, this blue, looks like it's centered to the pupil in the closed eye environment, then we know we're on the right track. So that's what we're looking for after one night. We wanna see that things appear to be going in the right direction. And then after full effect, we'd expect to see a blue treatment area that fills itself in um, really in a uniform manner. And it's going to give the patient the best quality of vision in the morning. That effect will last through to the afternoon and the evening. And um, that way we're giving the patient that optimal AM to PM vision that, that we need to, to provide them a good ortho K outcome. So if I asked you, which is the most important topography? Is it the baseline? Is it the one that determines your initial lens? Or is it the post-treatment, the one that determines the actual outcome? And Dr. Morgan and I would suggest to you that baseline map is the most important map that you will ever take in an ortho K patient. It's going to determine your first fit success. It's going to determine whether you have one post-treatment uh, chair time visit, um, the, the one night effect, or whether you need to discontinue and order another pair of lenses and then restart the treatment again. So spend the time on that baseline topography. It is absolutely critical. Now in the post-treatment, these are important maps too. And when we look at your subtraction, if you have a poor baseline and a poor post-treatment, then you may not understand what's happening with the fit. Here we can see we've got a bit of an island. We've got maybe the beginnings of a treatment area. We've got a hot spot up here that I'm not sure is real. Is that related to the lid being so close to the pupil? Is there a bit of a tear wedge on the edge of the lid? Is, is it the eyelash shadows coming down that are possibly creating a false steep spot? Or is that really the shape of the eye post wear? You can see that my post treatment topography, I didn't do a good job of asking the patient to open up wide. So it's really important to have a good post treatment as well. But I would suggest to you that you spend the extra time on that baseline map so that we can try to be 
first fit success with as many of our fits as possible. So to get an optimal topography, start by getting the patient to open up as wide as you possibly can. You know, here we see the rings are unobstructed through maybe a third of the cornea. The eyelash shadows are coming down throughout most of the superior hemisphere. And then on the inferior hemisphere, we have this big tear wedge right on the lower lid margin. That's going to block the lid, ref uh, the um, topographer's reflection off the corneal surface. So in this topography, I don't know how much of this I can trust. Is this steep spot down here real or is it from the tear wedge that's creating a false topography? Now, another consideration that's really important is the quality of the tear film. For those of you who use a reflection-based topographer, most topographers in, um, in eye care are placido-based topographers where you have all of these placido rings. And what they're doing is reflecting off the tear film. They're not reflecting off the cornea. So if the tear film is imperfect, if you've got tear film breakup, then the topographer can't understand the underlying cornea. So really important that you have a good reflection. And that means asking the patient to blink regularly. Don't ask them to hold their eye open for 12 seconds. I have the patient blink every four seconds. I wanna ensure that we're refreshing the tear film, that we're creating an even fluid layer over top of that corneal surface. And if there's any severe tear film breakup and you just can't ask the patient to blink enough, then use artificial tear. Find something that's relatively thin that won't create shape that isn't actually there. We don't want something too viscous. If this is the kind of reflection that you're seeing where the rings look parallel and even and you've got coverage going from superior to inferior with really no obstructions or the rings appearing to distort, this is what we want. This is when you want to snap that photo. This is going to create a good topography. Now here we've got four captures. And if we're trying to understand the initial shape of the eye, it might not be a bad idea to take multiple readings because you're dealing with a moving patient, a eye that's constantly moving, tear film that's constantly moving, and we may end up with tear film breakup if we're not careful. So it's not a bad idea to take multiple maps. And here we see four topographies that look the same. We've got a reproducible information and that will give you much more confidence that you have accurate topography. So always take multiple maps. That assures you that you are um, looking at reproducible and hopefully accurate topography. Now, if you happen to have a Medmont topographer, it allows you to do fixations in different directions. And what that does is essentially gives us topography of 100% of the cornea. So if you happen to have a Medmont, make sure you use the composite capture feature, which allows you to change fixation, take topographies in different directions, kind of like retinal um, mosaics or retinal photography. And then we're able to get that larger view of the cornea. An ortho-K lens is not a conventional GP diameter. It's not 9.5 millimeters. It's 10.6. It's 11 millimeters. Sometimes it's even bigger. So we want as much peripheral corneal information as we can acquire. So if you can get a large topography, a composite map, then um, that would be recommended. Ideally, any central imaging is good. And if you can get a good eight millimeters of data, that, that will be enough to design the lens. If you can get more than you really want it, that is very helpful in understanding the peripheral corneal shape, the toricity that you might need, changes post wear. So the more you can get, the better. Now the candidacy for the moon lens, the, vision, the Bausch & Lomb vision shaping treatment FDA approval is myopia up to minus five diopters and astigmatism one and a half diopters. Other considerations are a spherical cornea topographically is one that you would consider a very ideal case for ortho-K. A patient with astigmatism is not a bad case. 
And in this case, this is a good candidate for ortho K. Notice how the astigmatism is very apical. This figure eight is confined mostly to the pupil. Whereas this patient has limbus to limbus astigmatism, and that's one that might be slightly more challenging, harder to push the astigmatism out of the way. So spherical cornea, very ideal candidate. Apical astigmatism, a good candidate for ortho K. Limbus to limbus, one that I wouldn't be afraid of, but one that I might also be considering that uh, if it's a really high astigmatism and a high associated refractive sill, maybe I want to reconsider whether I do ortho K on this patient. So those are some of the considerations related to your baseline. Now, is this a good candidate for ortho K? Now that we've talked a little bit about some of the eye shape considerations, what would you consider in this patient? And we might start with all of these attributes that you're looking at on screen. Let's begin with the K readings. This patient has a 4374 diopter flat K, or about 43 and three quarters. Let's call that median to maybe median steep, and um, that would make this a relatively good candidate for ortho K. Remember, the steeper the cornea, the better the potential, the higher the refractive change you can create in ortho K. So as an example, if you had a 46 cornea and a high myopia, you might not be afraid to try that. If you had a 39 diopter cornea and a minus seven Rx, there's no way you should be thinking about trying ortho K on that patient. We can look at the corneal astigmatism and we've got about a diopter of corneal sill. That would suggest this is a relatively easy patient for ortho K. At around one and a half diopters of corneal astigmatism, that's what we would call a uh, threshold of a very easy candidate. Anything over that might be a little more challenging. What else could we look at? Well, the eccentricity we talked about earlier. What is eccentricity? And as you will recall, it's a measure of the rate of corneal flattening of the eye. So from the center, how steep is the cornea relative to how much it flattens out toward the periphery? So the greater the rate of change, the higher the eccentricity. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, it's important related to ortho K because the higher the eccentricity, the better the potential for ortho K, meaning the greater the ortho K effect you can create. And the reason for that is ortho K sphericalizes the central cornea. It moves the cornea in the direction of zero eccentricity. So if the cornea is high eccentricity, then you've got lots of room to maneuver in altering that tissue. But if the cornea is very low eccentricity to start, then it may be tough to create a high refractive change in the patient. So look at the E-value, another invaluable tool that helps you to determine, is this a really optimal candidate or not? And a normal E-value is somewhere between 0.55 or sorry, 0.5 and 0.65, depending on the topographer you use. So this patient at 0.76 is higher than the average, meaning this is a very good candidate. Now, when you, we consider astigmatism in ortho K, it's a very important consideration because not every patient can easily be um, fit with ortho K lenses. And here's an example where you have apical astigmatism and we sphericalize the central cornea. We push most of that astigmatism out of the way in the vertical meridian. Here you see the hot meridian, the astigmatic meridian, running from one side of the eye to the other. Post where we had a difficult time pushing that steep meridian out of the way. So consider that when it's apical, you may have an easy time sphericalizing the cornea and leaving the patient with very little residual sill. When it's limbus to limbus, then it may be a little more of a challenge. So that might be a case where you put on some um, uh, trial lenses and see how the patient does without that correction of sill. If the patient seems to manage just fine, then you know that it's probably not going to be an issue to leave that residual astigmatism post ortho K. 
But the uh, experts at Art Optical, the Moon Lens consultants at Art Optical can help you through when you're struggling to push that cylinder out of the way. So there's some things you can do to increase the hydraulic force to try to push that cylinder out. Now, another important consideration related to astigmatism is the sagittal differential. And this might be hard to get your head around, but um, let's spend a little bit of time on this. What this determines is the height of the eye where the lens will land. So if you look at this blue line here on top of our topography, we're trying to measure the height of the eye from the point where the moon lens would land. We're trying to determine how high do we need to build our contact lens. So what's the height of the flat meridian? Then compared to the steep meridian, what's the height of its opposing meridian? And therefore, what is the difference between the two? This patient has a 34 micron difference between the flat and steep meridian. And a moon lens will be calculated with a tericity at 30 microns and greater, meaning that if your patient has even borderline corneal astigmatism where the lens should land, um, Art Optical is going to build a toric landing lens to create the best lens to cornea surface. So we'll talk a little bit more about that one later. But essentially, whenever you've got 30 microns or greater of sagittal differential, that's when you want to think toric landing. Now, another consideration that's, uh, that we can glean from the topography is where a lens will position. The baseline topography will generally predict the position of the lens to a pretty high degree. Now, when you look at this topography, where do you think an, a rigid lens or an ortho K lens might position on this eye? When you look at these contours, what are they telling you? And we might pick out the steepest portion, this red, dark red here. Does this suggest that the lens will ride low because the peak of the cornea or the steepest part of the cornea is inferior? Well, the rigid lens doesn't land on the peak of the eye. It's going to land out in the periphery. It's going to land out here where this green yellow area is. So what's happening in the center is less important than the shape of the eye toward the periphery. So let's draw a dotted circle around that green yellow border. And you might notice that the circle appears to be slightly closer to the pupil here, maybe slightly farther away down here. So this eye shows a little bit of inferior displacement. So before we start in ortho K, we know that this patient is likely to have a lens that will slightly decenter. And that will tell us if the outcome is a slight, what's called frowny face lens riding a little bit low, um, that really we probably don't need to modify it because the lens is following the natural eye displacement. Now, we've talked a, a fair amount about the pre-fitting considerations. How do we actually design a lens? And when you are certified in the moon lens, Heart Optical will provide you with a link to the moon lens flex calculator, the software that will calculate the lens. So let's talk about what information this needs so that you can get to that first initial lens. And as we discussed, baseline topography is so important. If you can um, trust your one single map and you believe 100% in its accuracy, then one topography can do. But yeah, even as many maps as I've seen, and I'm sure Dr. Morgan would agree with me after seeing thousands of topographies, always having multiple images is, is helpful. That determines whether you have the reproducibility and likely the accuracy. So take multiple readings, or again, if you have the Medmont, do the composite eye capture. Now that we've got our topography, we need to pull the information from the map to build the lens in the software. And the first thing we want is something called the apical radii, or RO, or R0. What that means is not K reading, but it's the radii of the cornea at the center across the flat meridian and the radii of the cornea at the apex across the steep meridian. Now, why would you want this instead of K readings? And the reason is 
we want to build a lens from the peak of the eye down to its landing point. We don't want to start with the K reading that's partway along the mountain. We want to go right to the peak. So the apical radius or R0, radius at zero distance from center, is where we want to start. Many topographers use RO as the value that um, is, sorry, pardon me, they use RO as the label for the apical radius. So if you don't see apical radii in your topographer, look for R0 or RO. Now we've got the apical curvature of the cornea. Let's now collect the eccentricity. And remember that eccentricity is a measure of the rate of corneal flattening of the eye. So we want the two principal meridians, the flat meridian, the meridian where we'll have the greatest bearing. We want the steep meridian, the meridian of greatest depth. And with those two values alongside the apical radii, we can calculate most of the parameters that we need. So in your topographer, figure out where you can find the apical radii and the eccentricity for the flat and steep meridian. If you're lazy like me, you'll go to your topographer company and ask them, can you create for me an attribute so that it will just appear on my main window and I've got easy access to it so I can pull it up very quickly. So here we have the apical radii in millimeters. You can think of this in diopters as about 4463. So we, um, sorry, 4425 would be uh, the diopter conversion. So basically we want the radii in millimeters and we want the eccentricity in its E-value units at an eight millimeter cord diameter. So those two simple things, um, virtually every topographer will provide it, so you shouldn't have too much trouble. But again, the art optical, the uh, experts, the consultants, they can likely help you through um, finding some of this information. But your topographer company would be definitely the first place to start. They, they know where all this information is for sure. Now, another thing that we'll need is the visible iris diameter. It's important to create a custom ortho K lens for each individual eye. So measure the VID so you have a sense of how big or small the lens should be. Remember that an ortho K lens is going to cover a good portion of the cornea. So we don't want it to be too big. Uh, too big fits tight and could cause some desiccation of the conjunctiva if it's rubbing on the conj. A lens too small may be sloppy, may not center well. So we want to make sure we get the diameter right. Now let's go to the calculator and let's input this information. It looks like a fair amount of boxes, but it's really fairly simple and straightforward. Let's go through each. The first is diameter and the moon lens is best, uh, pardon me, the moon lens performs best at around a 10.6 diameter. That's the default diameter. You can trust that for most eyes. If you've got an incredibly large or incredibly small eye, then uh, the art optical consultants might be able to assist you in, in choosing the appropriate diameter. But a, a rule of thumb that's kind of industry common is you generally fit the lens diameter to within 0.8 millimeters of VID. So if you had an 11.4 visible iris diameter, a 10.6 diameter ortho K lens would be appropriate. If you find that the lens is sloppy, no matter what you do, whether you tighten it up or um, increase the toricity or whatever you've tried to uh, decrease the movement, you can generally fit an ortho K lens to within about 0.5 millimeters of the visible iris diameter. And that gives the lens a little bit of room to move around during REM, REM sleep as an example. Now, the next thing is optic zone. And this is one of the unique features of the moon lens, your ability to construct a lens with a customized optic zone for each patient based on their age and based on their Rx. So this, this particular consideration is important. So let's just take a second and talk about how we come up with this number. Let's assume that we had an adolescent and that we were considering the ortho K for myopia management. We would then say, okay, we have a youthful patient, one that's um, 15 years or younger. We would say, what is their Rx? If it's a minus three, then we're going to choose for that patient a 5.5 .5 optic zone. 
if we're fitting the same refraction, a minus three Rx, and it's an adult, we want the larger optic zone. And the thinking being, for adults, they're very sensitive to the aberrations. Refractive surgery taught us that. So let's try to minimize aberrations for the adults. But for the kids, the aberrations work well. Um, they help in myopia management. Now you'll notice at a four to 575 Rx that the optic zone is equal for both the children and the adults. And the reason for that is that when you reduce the optic zone size, that allows you to create higher refractive changes. So when we're talking about higher minus cases, this is when we may want to have a reduced optic zone size. And that's why you see the adult OZ come down. And then for very much off-label ortho K, when you're in the high Rx's, then you definitely want the small treatment zone, um, pardon me, the small optic zone, because that will allow us to move more epithelium because we need a much flatter base curved cornea relationship. We need to move tissue in a higher manner to create a flatter apical radius. So you can do that much easier with a smaller optic zone. So consider the age. When you have a 16-year-old patient who's driving at night, they may be more sensitive to the aberrations, and we might want to consider going up in optic zone when we're dealing with the younger patients and aberrations are more of a consideration for myopia management, then we're thinking smaller optic zone. So based on age and refraction, those are the two considerations. And this chart is available on the Moon Lens calculator, so you know exactly where to go. Now next is the Rx, and this one's fairly straightforward. We are going to vertex the spherical Rx when necessary. Ignore the cylinder. Generally, orthokeratology cuts the astigmatism in half, so it's not something you need to worry about too much. So generally, just take the spherical Rx, vertex it when you need to, and punch that into the software. Next, we want the apical radii, the RO, for the flat and the steep meridian. We want the eccentricity for the flat and the steep meridian. And we've got everything we need to calculate the lens. Now, what if we don't have quality topography on a patient? And this is going to happen. You know, of course, we do topography on, on so many of these kids, and they may not be so agreeable to sitting still. We may not be able to open the fissure up that much. We may not get a lot of good data from the topography. In such cases, you will use the K readings and a presumed eccentricity of 0.5. So let's assume that we can't get good topography. We're going to use as simple as K readings, and then we will assume that the cornea has a normal rate of flattening of 0.5 E value. That's the middle of the bell curve for eccentricity. And this will generally work quite well for a good portion of, of cases. But when you can get topography, obviously we're trying to create a customized lens for each individual eye. We're trying to get the depth right, the alignment zone right. We're trying to get the edge lift right. Um, we want the toricity correct. So all of these things, um, it's helpful if we can get good topography to, to be the most customized that are, that's possible. So for this patient, we have a VID of 12.1. We have a age of 13. So that would very much be in the myopia management range. We probably want the smaller optic zone. Our vertex Rx is four and a quarter. So that would suggest that we should be in a 5.5 optic zone. Remember age and Rx go together. Then we punch in the apical radii and the eccentricity for the flat and steep meridian. And now the software is going to calculate the lens you need. And it's going to do that. The moon lens calculator will determine um, the parameters to a micron level of accuracy. So let's start with the first is diameter. You can choose lens increments as small as 0.1 millimeters. As I said, you generally start with a 10.6 diameter. That's that standard diameter works for most eyes. The calculator is going to determine oh, the parameters of lens that will create approximately seven microns of apical clearance. It's going to determine the reverse curve depth. 
accurate to a micron. So you can alter the height of the lens in tiny little one micron increments. You can alter the landing of the lens in 0 0.01 degree increments in a, a fraction of a micron. And then finally, it's going to choose the toricity based on the entered data. So do you need a toric or do you need a symmetric? You don't have to worry about that. The software is going to figure that out. And here you can see in this case, we've entered the information for the right. We've entered the corneal data and refractive data for the left. Based on the shape of the eye for the right, the software has chosen a symmetric landing moon lens um, construction. Whereas for the left eye, the eye must have been over that 30 micron threshold. So it's chosen a toric landing for the lens. So consider that when that peripheral corneal shape is relatively toric, the moon lens is going to default to a toric landing. And, and the good news for you is that art optical charges the same whether you order a symmetric or a toric landing. You don't pay extra um, for one or the other. So it means that you're putting the right lens on the patient the first time. We're not putting a symmetric on, hoping it's going to work okay, and then going with the toric when we're forced to. Um, that's not the way the moon lens was designed. Now, there's many ways you can order. If you feel like this calculator is, is a little new to you and you want some help in the first few cases, contact the um, art optical consultants and they can help you through the, the process. If you want to self-calculate this information from your data, it's relatively straightforward and easy. Once you know where to find the information from your topography, it's really a snap then you can order the lens from Art Optical by either email or calling, or again, if you want to just send them the RX, the visible iris diameter and the topography, um, they can build the lens for you. Now, let's schedule the dispensing visit and the overnight wear. And in this, in the uh, case of your pre-dispensing evaluation, what do you want to look for? And I got to be honest, I'm not a, I'm not hugely worried about the fluorescein pattern before dispensing. And the reason for that is ortho K lenses work in the closed eye environment. They don't work in the open eye environment. You have absolutely no idea where the lens will position when the patient, patient closes their eye over that lens. So if you're seeing a lens that's reasonably well centered, if the patient has adequate comfort, I would just dispense it. I wouldn't be too nitpicky about whether the edge lift looks maybe wider than a half millimeter. Maybe there's more edge lift at 12 o'clock than there is at six o'clock. You know, those kind of considerations are not that important. The second the patient closes their eye over that lens and relaxes their lid, goes to sleep for six, eight, 10 hours. So let's send the patient home with this lens and see what actually happened. And this is where topography becomes so valuable to you. Now we talked about taking multiple maps pre-fitting. How many do you need post-treatment? Do you need to do four maps on that follow-up visit? And the story is no, you really don't need a lot of maps post-wear. I would take only two. So spend the, the time taking good pre-fitting topographies but post wear, just a couple maps will probably do because there's always going to be another post treatment visit. So if you actually messed up both of these post treatment maps, um, we'll always have another visit we can evaluate the patient on. Now, here is your post treatment topography, post ortho K wear. And this is what's called the axial map. And there are two principal topographies that you use the axial and the tangential. The axial is generally for visual cues. Now, what would you say is the outcome of ortho K? Did I do a good job here with this ortho K outcome? If you're not sure, well, let's switch over to the tangential map. And again, let's ask ourselves the same question. Is this a good ortho K outcome? What do you look for? And the story is you never, ever look at a post-treatment map by itself. You're always going to use that subtractive function. 
These single topographies, the axial or the tangential, they don't tell you the refractive change you've created. They don't tell you the treatment zone position. They don't tell you the treatment zone size. They don't tell you the lens position in the closed eye environment. They tell you what the cornea is now. They don't tell you how the cornea has changed. And that's why you need what's called the subtractive or difference map. And this is it. This is where we compare your pre-ortho K topography to your post-ortho K topography and measure the difference. So all 15,000 points of data that were collected from this map are compared to the thousands of data points compared to this map. And that gives us your subtraction. So wherever you see blue, you flatten the cornea over time. Wherever you see hot colors, yellow, orange, red, you steepen the cornea over time. Now the axial map tells you vision. So if I click my cursor right in the center, I can see this patient had a 4.7 diopter refractive change. I don't have to do a refraction because the topography will tell me how much apical corneal power change did you create? How much curvature did we present as power change to the fovea? So there's one thing. The second thing is the axial map tells you the treatment zone position. That's the blue area that's surrounded by the green. Green is where there's no effect, so where we haven't moved epithelium. So this blue area is your treatment area. And you might say that it appears a little bit low in relationship to the pupil, but this is not severe. This is really a very good outcome. Now next is you can observe on the graph across this white line, the powers you've distributed across the pupillary zone. The pupil's the dark gray here you see on the graph. And that helps you to understand the kind of myopia management that you have created. So this is a whole topic that we'll reserve for another session, but suffice it to say that the axial map is used to understand all of those visual cues, refractive change, treatment zone position, treatment zone size, and the uh, distribution of power within the pupil. The tangential map does only one thing, but it does one very important thing, and that's to tell you where the lens was positioned when the patient was sleeping. So this red ring is where the reservoir is in the ortho K lens, that dense fluid that you see, that ring of green band of fluorescein that surrounds the center area of what appears to be touch. So that reservoir is pulling on the epithelium, and that creates this uh, red ring that you see. Now, if you know that this is a left eye, where is the lens positioning, if anywhere? If you look at the, blue, the black pupil margin, where would you assume that your ortho K lens is positioned in the closed eye environment? And you might agree with me that the red ring is at least a square, a millimeter, inside the pupil here, it's partially beyond the pupil down here. So that lens is riding slightly down and slightly in on this eye. But again, this is a very good outcome. I don't wanna scare anybody. This is a beautiful topographical outcome for this patient. So when you assess these post-treatment maps, number one is you gotta get the subtractive map. Figure out in your topographer how you create what's called a subtractive map, a difference map or a comparison map. All the topographers use different terms, but ultimately what it does is it compares A from B equals C. What was the baseline compared to the post-treatment um, and how is it different? And that's what these subtractive maps tell you is what you've actually changed in ortho K. So there are five different outcomes that uh, follow an ortho-K effect. You have a bullseye, a central island, a frowny face, smiley face, or a lateral dis decentration. Let's talk about each. First is your bullseye. That means that you got the blue, blue, the blue treatment zone well centered to the pupil. Your effect, your hydraulic force is centered exactly where you want it to be. 
The tangential map shows you a red ring that follows the margins of the pupil quite well. And this is what's called the bullseye. This is the goal of ortho-K treatment. It means you got the sagittal depth correct. You've got the alignment zone correct. The lens wants to center. You've probably got the edge lift correct. That's created a, a healthy and optimal response. A bullseye can be associated with an overcorrection or undercorrection. So if that's the case, then you just simply contact the art optical consultants and they'll help you through to construct the right um, final uh, parameters. But if you've got the bullseye after one night, you're really happy because you know that from the outside, the lens is the right parameters to center well. Now you just have to wait it out and see if it creates the appropriate central effect. The central island is one that's characterized by this central steepening that's inside the blue treatment area. We are not flattening the central cornea, we're steepening the central cornea. It's usually associated with a blue treatment area that's slightly decentered inferior. When you look at the tangential map, look at this red ring and its position in relationship with the pupil. Notice the red ring is inside the pupil by a millimeter. It's at the pupil margin down here. So the entire area of hydraulic force is pulled down. And that's because a central island is a tight fitting lens. It's a steep lens. So it generally is causing the apex to steepen because you're so far off the central cornea. The second thing that happens is it's generally tight in the alignment zone that causes the lens to ride low. So to resolve a central island, you're going to reduce the depth of the reverse curve zone, the RCD. And generally 10 microns is the appropriate amount. You will also loosen up the alignment zone to try to bring the lens up. So the combination of reducing the height so we don't pull on the central epithelium and loosening up those peripheral curves should bring the lens up and give you the bullseye icon, um, outcome. Smiley face is the one that you see all the time. That, that one I would guesstimate for you that based on my ortho K experience, 80% of the time I get a bullseye um, right off the bat. 20% of the time we're going to get something else. And most of the time it's smiley face. And here is where you notice you've got a good blue treatment zone. You've created the flattening that you wanted, but it's decentered high. And that's pulled that paracentral steepening possibly inside the pupil. So a smiley face on the axial map is characterized by the blue treatment zone that's riding high. When you look at the tangential map, you'll see the red ring of paracentral steepening is displaced up. Notice it's more than a millimeter inside the pupil at six o'clock, whereas it's at the pupil margin at 12 o'clock. And you'll also notice there's other rings. You've got the red ring, but you also have this blue ring. That's the alignment zone of the lens. That's where the rigid contact lens touches down on the epithelium. So you can tell from that landing point where that lens was positioned as well. And you'll notice that the blue is inside the pupil here at six o'clock. It's a millimeter above at 12 o'clock. So to understand the tangential map, you want to understand those two rings, the red and the blue ring. That'll help to guide you on where your lens is positioning in the closed eye environment. So the smiley face is generally a lens too loose that we have in, in possibly a, a loose alignment zone, inadequate apical clearance or a diameter that's off. So the typical adjustments or the typical uh, fix for a smiley face is to simply tighten up the alignment zone by 0.5 degrees. And that will tighten up the landing enough that usually it neutralizes the lid force and the lens wants to come down slightly. If you have central SPK, if the lens actually has crashed into the central cornea and it's loose fitting, then you may want to also increase the RCD. So you're raising the height to get the lens off the apex of the eye and tightening up the alignment zone. So no staining, you're just going to tighten up the AZA, the alignment zone angle. If you have central corneal staining and a smiley face outcome, then you want to increase the reverse curve depth and tighten up the alignment. 
Now the frowny face is one of the others that you might see with um, some frequency, and that's the opposite of the smiley face, where the blue treatment zone is riding low in relationship to the pupil. You notice the upside down smile, the frown may be pulled into the pupil. We switch over to the tangential map and follow your red ring here. Notice how low that red ring is in relationship to the black pupil. Notice the blue where the alignment zone of the lens is. It's almost at the pupil margin here. It's somewhere off the charts down here. So this lens is definitely riding low. A frowny face is kind of like a central island in that it's too tight, but a frowny face actually has the right apical clearance. It's creating good hydraulic force in the center. It's simply that the periphery is too tight. So to resolve a frowny face, you just loosen up the alignment zone angle by 0.5 degrees. Another thing that you might want to check is the lens diameter. Um, if we've got an incredibly small lens on the eye, it might be kind of loose and sloppy fitting. It might want to fall down or too big a lens could create a tight fitting relationship and that could cause the lens to ride low. The final is lateral displacement. And here is where we see the lens decentering either nasal or temporal, and the uh, axial map showing us a blue treatment zone that's well outside on the temporal side. And we go to the tangential map, we see a red ring a millimeter inside the pupil here at the pupil margin over here. So this is your lateral displacement. That's typically a lens that's too loose in alignment, possibly too small. So we will tighten up the alignment zone angle by 0.5 degrees is one of the resolutions, but always check lens diameter. That might be one of the first things I would determine in an ortho K lens. Did I choose the right diameter for the eye? So in summary, um, what we want to think about is taking really good baseline topography. Make sure that you've got 100% corneal coverage if you can get it. Make sure that your rings look parallel and even. And that creates a topography that has a lot of corneal coverage with each contour appearing smooth and well-rounded, telling you that it's likely we have the real shape of the eye. The cornea is, of course, very smooth. So the topography should show contours that change in a very gradual manner. Take multiple topographies, and that way you can be sure if they're reproducible, they're likely accurate. You know, go for the highest first fit success possible. If you have the ability to do the composite map, if you have a Medmont, then that's what you'll use for your baseline. Now, when you're assessing pre-fitting um, information, an apical astigmat, this upper one is a better candidate for ortho -K. The limbus to limbus will be slightly tougher. So consider that when you're determining your candidacy. And then these subtractive maps, I, I, Dr. Morgan and I can't encourage you more to figure out how to get access to the subtraction. That will tell you everything about the post-treatment outcome. Is it bullseye? Is it central island? Is it smiley face? Is it frowny face? Is it lateral? How much refractive change did we create? Where is the treatment zone position? Where did the lens position in the closed eye environment? What's the kind of myopic shift through the pupillary zone that we created? So many valuable things gleaned from the subtractive map. So I think we're at this point where I can invite uh, Dr. Morgan to join me again, and um, we can uh, possibly take questions if there's time. I wanted to start by asking Dr. Morgan, um, he, you have been a clinical investigator for the earliest um, FDA approvals of ortho K lenses. There are many practitioners that say you don't need a topographer in ortho K practice. Um, Dr. Morgan, could I get your perspective on, <laughs> on that consideration? Would you think about ever practicing ortho K without a topographer? No, really, really um, I think what we thought at the beginning was that, um, you know, it wasn't that important uh, with the fit. And, and that's, you know, uh, something that a lot of the, the basic data that you can get with K's and refraction, you can get a lens that's pretty close. It's not going to be nearly as accurate, but you can kind of get in the game 
without a topographer, but then you're flying blind. You pretty much have no idea what you're doing to the cornea. And if things go south, you have nothing to compare that to and you're pretty much lost. And so really, it is really rather impossible, uh, you know, to, to, um, to accurately perform orthokeratology without a topographer. So um, very, very vital. And it becomes more and more vital when we talk about myopia management and we're gonna need to be way more precise uh, with our fits with those types of patients. So it's not gonna get any easier <laughs> with those types of patients. Um, we, did, we did get a lot of questions on the chat, uh, quite a few. Unfortunately, I think, you know, uh, to, to really uh, respect everybody's time, I think we're kind of at the end of our, our time frame. But I just want to remind our attendees that we will compile those questions and we will uh, get an answer to those questions later on. So uh, be looking for that, you know, being pushed out uh, in, in a future communication. Randy, thank you so much. I think, uh, as usual, excellent, excellent information. And I think uh, it's something that, you know, every practitioner can take with them and really get started or even if they're a current um, if they're a current fitter it's a good reminder what are some of the important things you need to pay attention to and specifically with some of these newer designs how the topography can help us be more successful and, and again you know thank thank you to everyone for uh, attending tonight we really appreciate everyone who is working to reduce myopia and help manage the myopia epidemic. As the sponsor of tonight's session, Art Optical, Art Optical will be following up to provide everyone the link to tonight's recording. So watch your inboxes for that release. And if you'd like to learn more about the specific products mentioned tonight, uh, those websites are shown here. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the session this evening and we wish you well in your myopia management practice. Good night and take care. Stay safe. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.